It may be a small island in the Atlantic Ocean, but Ireland has captured the imagination of the world. From its natural beauty to the richness of its unique culture. This stitch is not written down. Ireland has a kind of magic. And it's extra special to me because I was born here. And I felt it was high time to go back and get properly reacquainted with my native land. It's it very cold. <laughs> it's stunning landscapes, vibrant cities, and perhaps most of all, it's people. Cheers, won't you? Storytelling is really strong in Ireland. You look amazing. Yeah, that's brilliant. I turned that. <gasps> look at that. I defy anybody to come to a location like this and not just to smile. The magic never stops in here. I'm not going to leave. So come with me as I explore this enchanting country. Life changed forever when I was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. A cancer diagnosis really makes you reassess everything in your life, your past, your present, and your future. And my past began right here, well, over there, actually, in the city of Dublin. I was born here to a Greek mum and an English father. And I still have flashbacks of riding our dog Lara, a huge white Pyrenees mountain dog, who used to escape and run with the horses at the nearby Leopardstown racetrack. In my present, my partner's an Irishman and I have three Irish children. So Ireland is a pretty big part of my future too. I've had some great times in Dublin over the years, but I've never really taken the time to fully explore a country that's such a big part of my life. Later in the series, I'll return to my hometown, but I'm starting with a trip through a quieter part of Ireland's landscape. I'm in the South, in what was the early Irish kingdom. Today, it's the province of Munster. We're doing a bit of time travel, taking a path through more than 1,500 years of Irish history. I'll be covering a fair few miles of stunning landscape too, as I head from east to west and from Ireland's interior across the coastline of Cork, Ireland's biggest county, to its most southwesterly point at Mizenhead. I've clearly got a long way to go. So I'm starting my journey in Tipperary, a place immortalized by that famous ditty way back in 1912, the lament of a homesick Irishman living in London. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a Being here, you can see why he might feel so homesick. Tipperary is not just the largest inland county in Ireland. Its landscape of lush green fields boasts some of the richest agricultural land in the country. It's a fantastic view from here. Tipperary is nicknamed the Golden Vale, and you can see why. The Vale is really the basin of the River Sur, which runs through the county and brought people to these parts very early in Irish history. Which is why I'm starting my journey with one of the most important historic sites in the whole of Ireland. This is a good looking view, but this this is one of the finest remaining clusters of medieval buildings in the whole of Europe. This is the Rock of Cashel, and its history goes way back to the fourth century, when it became the proud seat of the Kings of Munster, one of the four separate kingdoms that made up this island before Ireland became a unified country. Elaine, a very popular site. Loads of people here today. Definitely, yeah. We would be one of the most visited off the public work sites in the country. Uh, we get maybe 380, 390,000 people a year. The old king's castles are long gone. In the fifth century, it's rumoured St. Patrick himself converted a Munster king to Christianity here at the Rock. And centuries later, the church got its reward. During the 12th century, one of the most famous kings of Cashel, Murtagh of Rain, he saw himself as a bit of a church reformer and he held or convened a synod here at Cashel in the 12th century and he handed the rock of Cashel to the religious as a gift. Right, so that was the transition from, from the, kings from to, to church. To, to, to church. So the buildings that you're looking at here today, which are in total five ecclesiastical buildings, are from that period, from the 12th up until the 18th century. So 
So this is the chapel, which I've heard being called the most beautiful building in Ireland. Yes, we call it the uh, jewel in the crown of the Rock of Cashel. It's Cormac's Chapel. And as you can see, it's a different colour from yeah. the rest of the buildings. It's a, a sandstone. It was brought from about 12 miles north of here in a place called Drumban. Sandstone is a very porous stone. It's like a sponge, so it absorbs quite a lot of moisture. And inside we have mid 12th century frescoes and the frescoes um, were becoming compromised because when water comes through the chapel sandstone, it brings salts with it, mm. forming microbiological growth on those frescoes. So a major conservation program had to start. So we covered the entire chapel and let the building dry out naturally itself. And within the chapel then, because of the likes of you and I and visitors walking into Cormac's Chapel, bringing wet gear, breathing even. Moisture. Moisture within the chapel itself. The time that visitors can go in within the chapel is 15 minutes and then it's closed for 45. Well, I'm very excited to see them. And yeah. we can't stay in there too long. Not too long, I'm afraid. I'll have to stop talking. That's going to be really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> We're in. And here are our frescoes. Oh my goodness. So these are mid 12th century frescoes and a fresco is obviously, it's, it's, it's wet plaster and wet paint on that and that's when it dries. You have a vermilion and especially we've got gold leaf, but more expensive in its day was lapis lazuli. You see the beautiful blue color. Yes, I and that, love that. That was brought from Afghanistan through Venice to Cashel. So it really shows you how important Cashel was at that time. Mm. It was uh, in terms of not only Irish history, but European history. And you can see the Magi in front of Herod. It's a very special atmosphere in here. It is, yeah. Oh, this is the uh, little courtyard. This is the uh, main door into Carl's Chapel. The main door? Yes. So in the 12th century, this is the door you would have come through. Right. So the door we came through was the back door, the south door. This is the north door of the chapel. But this? This is our 13th century Gothic cathedral. So really they sandwiched this big cathedral <laughs> in between Cormac's Chapel and the Round Tower, which are two 12th century buildings. And, and they really did sandwich it. Look how close we are. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a couple of inches. They did a good job. They sure <laughs> did. You can feel the history in these old structures. And I can completely understand why the rock attracts so many visitors every year, hundreds of thousands. It's definitely worth coming to see. the joys of Ireland is that past and present sit side by side. Just a five minute wander from the drama and history of the rock and you're in Cashel, which is this quaint little town packed full of cafes and curiosities. One of the most popular is Rossa Pottery, which has been owned by the same family for over 60 years. These beautifully glazed bowls, mugs and jugs are all made by hand using a potter's wheel. The man who makes them is Alan Walsh, who took over the business from his dad and runs it with his wife, Sarah. See, I can just imagine one of my very big, colourful salads in that gorgeous bowl. Well, thank you. Well, well yeah, the fact that well, it's made by hand, it's very important for me to make it by hand. It's very traditional, a tradition of craft, and to keep that alive is very important to me. Mm. So literally from, from the piece of clay right up to the finished product, even to the fact that we actually hand sign it as a, as a signature maybe of the artist, to all the way through, we're pushing the handmade because there are very few of us left. This reminds me of sticky toffee pudding when the when the treacle starts to run down the cake. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And I that love it. would be controlled to a certain 
extent. Yeah. So if you can see here, the glaze, we have that controlled by temperature. If that glaze hits the kiln shelf, we have to get a hammer and break it off. The big question is, will you let me free on a potter's wheel? Well, you will not come to Ross Pottery unless you put, we put you on a wheel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, was, that was the answer I was oh, looking for. This is going to be the real Mackay. So through here we go. Yeah. <gasps> this, this is where it all happens. Uh, can I touch these? You can, of course. You can. Yeah, that is, that is pure clay. That was made uh, yesterday and I turned it on the wheel. Um, that's a, we call that the new Mediterranean bowl. Which is probably why I went straight to yeah, it. Yeah, possibly, it. yeah. It's... These are mugs that have been handled uh, a few days ago. Yeah. And that's the blue slip, that's the blue we, we, we put on it. That gives it the blue colour. I just, I yeah. cannot explain yeah. that texture. Yeah. It's a little bit like touching a dolphin. I don't know if you've touched a dolphin, but that's... I've never touched a dolphin. It's, it's like, it's that soft. It's, it's, it's not slippery, but it's no. silky. Oh, it's lovely. Okay. This is like arm wrestling. This little piece of clay is quite strong. So what you want to do, I want you to tuck in your elbows into your body. Yeah, yeah. I want to put your forearms down here. So press down in here. Okay, right? okay. I want you to get your, your, your wrist. I want you to harden that wrist so that wrist yeah. is strong. Yeah. Connect it to your elbow. To, so when, when that moves, it moves your body. So you're using your body weight against this. Okay. Right? That's about it, right? Okay. So with your hands wet, always use wet water because okay. it's on you. It's kind of like a car. You're, you're kind of sliding your, your aqua planing over it. So it's similar. So we're going to wet your hands together. Okay. Yeah. Hands in there. That's no, warm. no, no, I warmed it up for you. But oh, the, the washer, you. yeah, it's going to be. So okay. elbows in. Yeah. Uh, wrists all tightened up yeah. and then slowly but surely get your get your hands here down on the wheel head okay. and then you come slowly. So push in a bit more yeah. and push down. That's it. That's very good. I mean, I just push down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that makes all the difference. Oh yeah, that's very good. So take away your hands very slowly now. You're nearly in centre there. We're going to make a bowl. With your thumb connected to two thumbs. Your yeah, thumb is, yeah. This thumb is just... This thumb comes over and it connects, and I want you to go straight down. It's like chocolate. Yeah, spinning it is around, chocolate. Around yeah, it's like it? it doesn't taste like it. I can no. show you when you get it in your mouth. It does not. All right. Oh. Okay, yeah, that's all right. Hands up. That's, that's all right. We can get another piece of clay for you. <laughs> that's the. Get you another, uh -oh, fail. I get you another broke, piece of clay. Throat pot number one. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. Right, so, so fingers down, so, yeah. pinching Pin inwards. Pinching inwards and pinching with the thumb. Yeah. And then you're supporting with your, with your right hand. Yeah. And then as you pinch, you bring upwards. That's really, really, <laughs> really... I mean, look, there's not a kick on that. that is, I mean, that is completely in centre. I'm going to fire that, I'm going to glaze it, and we're going to send it to you. Oh. All right? OK? Because that is, that, is, that is lovely. That's beautiful. And up it comes. Oh, I'm really chuffed with that. It's it's a little beauty. It is. Uh, what solid. an experience. No, it's good. No, it's a, but it's very it's very therapeutic. The yeah, clay in your hands, it's... the squishy squashy. It's lovely. Yeah, yeah. You're you're very good at it. Oh, very good. Well, I've really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Everybody should have a go at this. The show. A bit of pottering. Time now to leave the lush fields of Tipperary and head down to the coast. I'm bypassing the city of Cork to go to another small town just to its west. This is Kinsale and the start of what's become known as the Wild Atlantic Way, one of the longest continuous ocean routes in the world that stretches from here up to Donegal in the far northwest. Kinsale sits in a harbour just in from the ocean itself where the River Bandon flows into the Wild Atlantic. In days gone by, it was an important strategic site for the defence of Ireland from foreign invasion. Its natural harbour made Kinsale a vital trading port too, one reason being the amount of great local produce coming from the land and sea surrounding it. And the main reason I'm coming here today is to eat, because this little town has become the gourmet capital of Ireland.
My guide is Suzanne Burns, a marine zoologist and former scallop farmer. Suzanne now gives tasting tours of Kinsale to visitors from all around the world. She believes the town's foodie reputation lies in its geography and its history. So Kinsale is a really unique history. Um, it was actually one of the busiest trading ports in Europe in the 1600s. They imported a lot of wine and salt, and they exported a lot of linen and dairy products and fish. Mm. And the fishing industry was so prolific here in the 1800s that you could almost walk from boat to boat all the way across the harbour. There could be like three, four hundred boats here at any one time. On a busy day, there could be up to 700. Gosh. And then there'd be hundreds of women on either side of the waterfront gutting the fish. So it'd be like bloody and noisy and, and smelly, smelly. <laughs> yeah. and chaotic. So it's massively changed since then. The town's gourmet era began in the early 70s when its top hotels got together to create a food circle to drive up the quality of cooking to match the standard of those local ingredients. French chefs came in, Keith Floyd came in, and you know he's such a, he was such a wonderful raconteur and such a funny man and you know so likable and, and people really took to him and, and all the other people that came in as well. So um, it reinvented itself and, and this has been born out of a, a spirit of cooperation between the venues. There's a deep understanding here, it's like you're stronger together. We're going on a food tour today. We are indeed. Um, where are we starting, please? We're starting Max's restaurant. Okay, I look forward to saying hi to Max, whoever he or she is. It's actually named after a dog, a doberman called Max. Yeah, long story. Fish are almost leaping onto your plate, we're so close to the ocean. First up then, a chance to taste some of that great local fish and seafood. Frenchman Olivier Cueva is one of the many overseas chefs who've made a home here. This platter looks like West Cork on a plate. Oh, that is so good. Oh, that's amazing. Spider crab. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Oh, that's amazing. We've got a cold current coming from the south of France, from the Bay of Biscay, mm -hmm. that comes here and hits the south, and it brings that cold water, which means in May and June you've got a lot of green water. There's a bloom of plankton and algae, and that does bring all the feed. And that feed attracts an incredible range of fish and seafood to these shores, some of which Olivier forages himself. You spearfish, I understand. I do free dive and spearfish, yes. Um, so I get my own, it's mainly for my own consumption. There's no better enjoyment than to come back home with a big hamper of food you've been foraging. Mm. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I came home on a Monday with some sea bass, and I came back home on a Tuesday with some uh, lobster. So for us on Tuesday supper, uh, we had a wild sea bass and lobster fricassee with some asparagus, uh, wild leeks, and a few mushrooms like that. And my son is eating that. My son at the time is 10 years old, and he thinks it's grand. He thinks every single 10 years old boy in Ireland is having on Tuesday for <laughs> dinner some wild sea bass and lobster. Um, Do you two forage you... together ever? Because I know you forage he, as well. He basically won't show me where his foraging spots are. Ah, ah of course if, not. Yeah, if he tells me, he'll have to come. Well, that's what I said. Things yeah. are going slowly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. My competition. I told her where it was. It you, is you between Belfast, me. Cork, Galway, <laughs> and Dublin, somewhere there. You know? Yeah. With all this talk of a natural larder, it's appropriate that our next stop is the Gourmet Pantry, Kinsale's award-winning local deli. Hello. 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 Hi, Welcome hi. to the Gourmet Pantry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is this what we, we're here for? We, we've, had, we've had the main course, so you brought yeah, me here for tea. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought, you know, if you're in Ireland, like we have 200 farmhouse cheese in the country and we've got 86 cheese makers. Um, so we really pack a punch for the mm. size of the country. Mm. And the dairy in Ireland is like unparalleled because we've got really mild climate, we've loads of rain, we've really good soils. Um, and the cattle are outside, they're grazing yeah. outside on all the lush green grass yeah. as opposed to being inside, penned up, eating grain. Yeah, like they're super happy cows. Okay, and if you were me, which one would you go for first? First, the Tipperary Brie. The Tipperary Brie, yeah. I, see, I love a Brie. Yeah. You're a there woman you after my own heart. <laughs> okay. Nice with the grape as well. Yeah. Lovely, let's go for it. Yeah, after okay. you. Okay, all right, I'm gonna go a little bit of 
I'm going to break your heart. Mmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, that's so good. Mm. Really that's mild. A, yeah. But very lovely. Yeah. It's a big moment for me. The Cashel Blue, mm -hmm. close to Cashel. Here it's goes a, nothing. It's a, it's a world first for <laughs> me. Mm. 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 Happy? Mm. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. And I don't know how you work in here. I would, I'd be the size of a house. <laughs> <laughs> I would be self control. Mm. Feeling quite full now. Are we done? Not quite. You are going to love this. Am I? Here? Yep. Ah. Hello. Hi, Hello. Julia. How are you? Oh, well, I'm, I was just saying how hey. full I was. But Suzanne said, I think you're going to like this. There's and, always and, room for chocolate. And now you are absolutely, unfortunately, you're right. <laughs> and these look like exceptionally good chocolates. I've had a, a, a revelation in later life, shall we say, and I've completely turned on to dark chocolate and ah. moved away from the highly processed, really sugary, sweet stuff that I used to love, but actually I don't anymore. I've actually made a chocolate especially for you because a little birdie told me that you like really dark chocolate and you also like fruit. Yes, it's true. So you are kind of our guinea pig on this one. <laughs> uh, we've used uh, sour dark cherries, um, sudachi. Have you come across sudachi? No. It's a, a Japanese fruit Ooh. that's crossed between a lemon and a grapefruit and a bit of orange in it as well. And the fat that I put in this is actually coconut oil. Oh. So there's no butter. Love it. And the, the body of this chocolate is 96% dark chocolate. Oh. And then you can see what it looks like. You'll get the flavor straight Come away. Come on, Suzanne, grab um, one. Anybody let's, else? Let's pop them together. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Uh, Slyncha. Cheers. Can, can I try Slyncha. one too? Go I don't know. Mmm. I love the creamy texture. They're really, really, really good. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to explode. <laughs> well, where are you going next? Central I'm going to lie place. down now. That's where I'm going. <laughs> Bed. Do you know any and good hotels around here? I do, I do. I know a few. <laughs> To say I'm full is an understatement. Kinsale in this area have been a revelation. The food produce is just amazing. And what's really interesting is that both here and in Cashel, the businesses support each other. Genuinely, they drive each other on. It's a real ecosystem. Now I just got to find a way to work off all that cheese and chocolate. I'm stuffed. After my feeding extravaganza in Kinsale, I needed some movement back in my life. So I'm heading deeper into West Cork towards that beauty down there. It's called Castlehaven Bay. Castlehaven Bay is one of the many large inlets on the craggy Cork shoreline. In days gone by, it was a hotbed of piracy and smuggling, and there was a major naval battle here in 1609 it's certainly seen its fair share of ships and seafarers. And two people who've turned their passion for being on the water into a successful business are Jim and Maria Kennedy. Jim's a four-time British kayaking champion, and he and Maria were the first in the country to take visitors out on kayaks to explore the bay. Maria's become a bit of an expert seaweed forager too. More of that later. First, time to take to the water with Jim. If you look at Ireland, the map of Ireland is like a beer. And we're down where his toes are. And the, the land down here, we have lots of long bays, as opposed to the east coast or the west coast. It's very open. They don't have these long bays we do. So for us, it's the perfect place for the kayaking because we can get all these shelters. So how did you go from racing to this? Well, I raced for years. I represented Ireland then. I retired and I moved to West Cork, where I met Maria, my wife now. 
Myself and Maria started this business, Atlantic Sea Kayaking, 30 years ago now. In those days, we were the only ones in Ireland with kayaks, but now kayaking has become huge around the world. It's immensely popular, isn't it, yeah. now? So what do people get out of this experience, Jim? Yeah, I, th I think more and more, Julia, people are finding it harder and harder to kind of find the, their inner peace, their tranquility, and to just get into where they are without thinking about tomorrow. I once heard a saying that if, if you're living in the future and living in the past, you're not living in the now. So we like to try and guide people into that. And nature is such a helper for us. Nature has everything. Mm -hmm. We just try and make people aware of what's around them. We might try it in a few minutes if you wish and we get a nice quiet place when we come back and just see, can we get a little bit of peace and quiet in oh, our lives? I'd love to. Steal back the time, eh? Yeah, there's a whole world going on around you, so forget the paddles. Let's just, for a moment, sit back and relax completely. Now, just check your fingers and your legs, make sure they're relaxed. No death grip on your paddles. Maybe take a few slow, deep breaths into your lower stomach, just nice and quiet, just to gather you. Try and figure out how many things you can hear. Hear the birds in the background and the lapping of the waves against the shale on the beach. It's been a pleasure out paddling with you. It's been fantastic, thank, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. And I'm delighted to carry on exploring this beautiful coastline with Jim's wife, Maria. Maria loves teaching visitors about the joys of foraging for many types of seaweed that permeate the shoreline here. Okay, yes, I'm gonna be eating again, but seaweed is very good for you. I'm gonna give you the bowl. Okay, I love this. Look at that. We use a scissors bowl. and we just take like the last third of the plant. Right. So we don't rip it off the rocks and then it can continue to grow. So it's perfect. Yeah. So yeah. we'll take Sustainability. A bit of, yeah, we're all about that. Mainly what I do is I'll I'll pick we'll pick a little bit today and yeah. then I convert it into food or cosmetics. Like it's a garden, a, mm. a beautiful garden that you know, there's seaweeds all through the year that you can eat, that you can harvest. You don't have to do any weeding. You don't have to add any nutrients. They're all there. Okay, I'm going to have a go at cutting yeah, a bit of channel right because I watched so here. The last so just third, the last third. Yeah. And what will we do with this one? What's the specialist? Yeah, what well, we're going to use this. Um, you can taste it right now, Julia. Yeah, I will. It's a very light taste. Mm, lovely texture because yeah, it's quite, texture. quite rubbery. It's quite crunchy, light. isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Oh, super light. Yeah. Not too, no, not too much of the no, sea. No heavy flavours. Definitely there. not like seaweedy, seaweedy. Yeah. Not um, even salty, really. No, no. it's got, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to take it back. Like, like, God, I just want you just want you know that's you, on top of all your salads and your veggies. Egg salad. It's great in a salad or a stir fry. So we're going to blanch it and and uh, you'll see what happens. So canopy number one done. Yeah. Down we go. Yeah. So this is a rack and, you know, here you're seeing bladder rack and the serrated rack. Yeah. And then just for something a little bit different, there is a tiny little seaweed here called pepper dulse. <gasps> now, tiny it is, but it's the truffle of the sea. It's like the chef's favorite. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it in has Kinsale, everything. Yeah. Um, there was a chef called uh, Olivier in Max's and he put this, I think, on his hake. Yeah. Look at that little thing. Yeah. So that is as delicate, that. Yeah. as delicate as it comes. But what a so powerful does. flavor. Oh. Unbelievable, isn't Ooh. it? Yeah. Yeah. That is pungent. Yeah. You'll be tasting that still in half an hour. Thank you. <laughs> garlic. I get the garlic today. Garlic, pepper, yeah. Garlic people, for sure, yeah. People taste different things, yeah, don't they? Today, yeah. I got the garlic. The garlic yeah. 
Oh, yeah. that's magical. So how much do we want of this? So just a tiny amount, the very tip. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to put that in, uh, in our hummus. Now that is what you call a plate of green goodness. Yeah. Now foraging is fun, but I have to tell you, it's a pretty cold day and I'm well wrapped up. Unlike some people around here. <laughs> Julia wanted to say hello, Julia. Hello, ladies. <laughs> How is it? Is it very cold? Is it pins and needles? <laughs> they make them out of something special here in West Cork. Talk me through this incredible looking table. This I'm very excited yes. by. I would call that a superfood salad, for yep. sure. So, it, it, you know, it's got the usual lovely organic carrots and cucumber. It's some of your some, kale. Yeah, it's got some kale from the garden. But this, this is the power ingredient right here. That's the channel rack that we picked, blanched quickly in boiling water. You can see the chlorophyll. You can imagine the goodness it's going to do you. Oh. Crunchy. Crunchy. Fresh. Honestly, I'm I'm not exaggerating when I say you can taste the goodness. Mm. It's like just crunching into nature and absorbing it into your body and feeling all that goodness, goodness filtering yeah. down. Yeah. That is incredible. And yeah. I, I just love this <laughs> and I sneak a bit when no one's looking. Mm. I hate to tell you, Jim, but we're all looking. <laughs> Longingly, right? So this is a hummus so, I heard you yeah, say This earlier. is a regular hummus and, uh, you know, the pepper dulse, remember? The that, little tiny, yeah, really pungent The truffle tasting. of the sea mm. with that umami flavour. And this is the time of year for the pepper dulse. It's mm. at its best. Yeah, and I don't have to put salt and pepper in there. I put Instead, I put the pepper dulse and it just rises the flavour. For the cake, we use a nari seaweed, which is little, it's almost got a sweet uh, yeah. factor in it. And it's a really delicious flavour. So it works very well for baked goods. Um, beetroot, lots of beetroot in there. Uh -huh. And dark, dark chocolate, 85%. So. Right, I'm going to go for, I always like the middle bit of a cake. There you go, Julia. Thank you. Oh, gosh, I've lost it. Oh, look, it's just a disaster. <laughs> look at me, I'm not going to get a cooking show out of this, am I? The, the great thing, Julia, about eating outside is the birds love the crumbs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A look. Oh. Seaweed cake with beetroot. Amazing. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That dark, 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 dark. Oh, gosh. Please just leave me here. <laughs> That's a mix of all kinds of seaweeds. It's and what do I in here? Cooking or, or? You just fire it into anything. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. That's <laughs> amazing. I will. And it'll keep for years. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, but... how, am I, how am I going to take this cake with me? Oh. That's <laughs> what I want to know. <laughs>
biggest humanitarian disaster of the 19th century Europe. Over a period of about six years, over one million Irish people died and almost another million and a half emigrated. It completely, it was a catastrophe in this country. The whole society collapsed, essentially. Back in the 1840s, Ireland was ruled by Britain and native Irish Catholics were forbidden to own land. This massive population of tenant farmers became dependent on the potato and the average Irishman ate 6.4 kilograms of them a day. When successive blights devastated the potato crop, the result was mass starvation. All along the southwest and northwest coast was really badly affected. And here in Skibbereen, one of the first large-scale soup kitchens in Ireland opened on the 7th of November 1846 in the building just directly opposite here. And that was used almost as a template for government soup kitchens. And at its height, the soup kitchens all over Ireland fed up to three and a half million people every single day. It kept people alive. In actual fact, it halted the famine in the summer of 1847. But then the British government withdrew support for the soup kitchens and told the Irish they had to support themselves. In Skibbereen, one in three people died. This is a sketch of the infamous death cart in Skibbereen. This creaked its way through the town and picked up people um, because the imperative was to bury them fast. They employed a man, he was given a shilling per body for burying bodies. And of course, he, he, if you were cold on the side of the road, you were picked up and thrown in the death cart and thrown into the pits. So there were quite a few accounts of people being buried alive, oh. <gasps> including one that my own grandmother knew. Yeah, yeah, who obviously lived to tell the tale if yes. Granny Barry met him. Yeah. There was huge acts of individual bravery during that period. People in danger of their lives coming to Skibbereen to see how bad it was so they could write about it and draw attention to here. Mm. This is a magistrate from Cork City who came down to Skibbereen and see how bad things were. Mm. And he was a very clever man. He went back up to Cork and he wrote an open letter to the Duke of Wellington. And he sent various copies to various newspapers all over Ireland and Britain. And it made the front page of the Times of London, Christmas Eve, 1846. So people are sitting down to their main meal of the mm -hmm. year and they read about people in their own country at that stage dying of starvation. And this letter had a profound impact. It opened people's hearts. Thousands of individual people, a lot of them very poor, mm -hmm. across England, Scotland and Wales, started to send money into Ireland. The British Relief Association was set up shortly afterwards, primarily by members of the Jewish community and the banking fraternity in London. That brought £400,000 worth of aid into Ireland. What impact has the famine had on the culture of Ireland, do you think? Oh, huge, um, profound. Pre-famine Ireland and post-famine Ireland are two entirely different places. Um, everything changed. Society changed, the economics changed. But for me, cultural changes, there was the highest number of people speaking the Irish language on the eve of the Great Famine ever in history, but it killed it. Why would you be speaking the language of the poor to your child if you're preparing them for emigration? Because that's what they were doing. So we lost a huge amount of our culture. But for me, the biggest change is the one that was hardest to explain, is the psychological change. We went from this loose, free, marry who you like society to this lockdown, repressive society that we were dealing with in Ireland up until very, very recently. Mm. The church gained strength. And so it, it really had a profound impact on the psyche of the people. And everything came a, a bit more controlled. Oh, completely. Which does change your psyche. Yeah. And they were suffering from post-traumatic stress. You know, we have a term for it now. And epigenetics tells us that we survivors in Ireland today, our DNA is altered because of that, you know. And any, any nation or race that comes through such a huge psychological trauma, including starvation, it has huge impacts, you know, there's a higher rate of alcoholism, mental illness and so on, and many, many studies of that. So it's very, very interesting that it affects subsequent generations. It's not just the generation that lived through it. And we, as a culture, were still impacted by that. After my emotional chat with Terry, I visited Abistrauri Cemetery. In the middle of it is a mass unmarked grave or pit, and it's estimated 10,000 bodies were thrown from those death carts during the famine years. It's hard to imagine how these people and this community must have suffered, but this is a powerful memorial to one of the worst humanitarian disasters in history. Mm -hmm. 
I'm back on the coast again now, en route to my end destination of the spectacular Mizzen Head, the rocky peninsula that is the most southwesterly point in Ireland. Just before you reach its tip, there's yet another secluded beach to enjoy at Barley Cove. They say that this is one of the most beautiful beaches in the country. You can certainly see the appeal of this southwest corner of Ireland, can't you? But from a boat, the craggy coastline can seem a much more dangerous place, especially in the strong winds that are a pretty regular occurrence here. There are lots of lighthouses and signal stations strung across the region. This tower was built in 1804 as one of a network of signal towers created to send signals along the Irish coast in case of a potential invasion by Napoleon. And these ruins were a signal station used by the great Italian inventor Marconi. Marconi sent some of the earliest radio signals across the Atlantic from here in 1904. Which brings me to my final destination. Well, I'm coming to the end of my travels now, and uh, you could say that I've left the best till last. This is Mizzen Head, and it's the most southwesterly point of Ireland. And I am not going to waste a precious drop of this fresh air. Fill your boots, as I say here. Fill your boots! Mizzen Head is a truly spectacular site. Its very end point is almost an island, and the only way to get to it is to cross this high bridge. I defy anybody to come to a location like this and not just to smile and feel happy. <laughs> the drama and the noises and the birds. An incredible view. And if you've got a head for heights, look down there and listen. Listen to those waves crashing against the rocks. Just to the south of here is one of the main transatlantic shipping routes. And for old seafarers in times gone by, this would have been their first glimpse of Europe. Or their last, if they were heading home. This signal station was another vital warning system on this treacherous coast. It was one of the first places in the world to have radio communications with ships, and many lives were saved by the old lightkeepers. So I'm fascinated to meet Jerry Butler, who spent many happy years working in this beautiful but rather remote spot. Jerry, how long did you work here? I was nine, nine years working here. Um, the most uh, wonderful place I ever worked on. So we would spend a month on here and a month at home. It was just blissful because I remember when I was here, uh, I brought my children out here and we slept in the workman's hut here on the top. They must have loved it. They I mean, did. It'd be like the best camping trip in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but they were so small that you had to be so careful of them. Yeah. You had to keep them in because we're right at the edge of a cliff. Bringing them across the bridge on the, in the wheelbarrow for safety. <laughs> The Mizzen station has a long history, and before radio, Jerry remembers the old days when the signal was simply a controlled explosion. It was an explosive fog signal we ran here, uh, adventurous to say the very least. We had the electric detonators and we used tonite uh, charges. Now the tonite charge would be about the size of a closed fist, and we'd put the electric detonator into the center of it, hang it on the firing jib, you pressed the button and it exploded. Gosh. This station was raided by the IRA during the War of Independence. And I, as far as I know, it was raided about six times. So the explosives were completely taken from That's here. That's what they were after. They That's were after the booty. They, need, they needed that. So let me get this right. Explosives were set off as a way of illuminating this area for ships out there. For ships in, in thick fog. Navigation was nothing like what it is today. Time slowed down so much. The life was so sedentary, so sedate. And um, I remember when I'd come ashore after my month, um, I was not able for loud noises. And the pace of life 
was, uh, was such a contrast. You must have seen some incredible wildlife. Yes, I did. Um, I know it might sound funny, but one of the very interesting thing was to watch two seals mating. And they spent 24 hours doing that. Are they courting? Yes, yes. And nobody else would get the chance to do Absolutely. that, would you? You might catch an hour if you're lucky, yeah. or a minute even. Looking at these things was just pure magic. An education? Total. I think we can all learn something from the silence and the peace and the yes. slowing of the pace, can't we? We yes, should we all can. be a bit more Jerry. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we can't all be, even Jerry can't be Jerry all the time. <laughs> Nature can play this trick on you. It humbles you and it grounds you. But it also rejuvenates you. You really do get that feeling of being on the edge of the world here. Well, a continent at least. Thank you, West Cork. You've been beautiful. Support information for the issues raised can be found online at channel4.com slash support. And from West Cork to Ireland's own Wild West, Julia's journey continues next Saturday at 8.35 here on Channel 4, or you can stream all episodes right now.